In the middle of life's most difficult times, God is there, He is there in the midst, and He is with us today. Welcome to Hope Today. I'm Tom, I'm here with Corey and Amy. We're gonna be praying in just a little bit for the situation, uh, 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 what's going on in Nashville, but we, we wanna let you know who's coming up. We've got a great guest coming up, Amy. Yes, our next guest is going to tell us why I'm full of it, you're full of it, they're <laughs> full of it, and that is personality. You are so full of personality, but have you ever noticed how we all are a little bit different, but there are some groups of people that do act alike. We are going to unpack today the Enneagram life. Now we have the famous Elizabeth Bennett here with us from Pride and Prejudice. She is live in the flesh to talk about personal, relational, and biblical insights for all seasons. You know, guys, I, the more I read about this and we had a guest a couple of weeks ago, the more a lot of it just makes sense. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested. What did people tell you growing up what your personality was? Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting because, you know, your parents are always playing games with you and trying to figure out who you are. You know, like my mother, she wanted me to be a chef and she gave my, my brother piano lessons. But I ended up being the one that played piano, and my brother's the chef. <laughs> you know, so she was close, but you know, it was kind of like she was in the zone. Go, she mom! Was, she was close. Close. You all were rebellious from the beginning, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> no, that's, that's good stuff. Well, yeah. uh, you know, it's going to be fun to, to just dig into that. But we we want to take some time for the very difficult situation of what's going on in Nashville, what happened in Nashville and uh, with the six people being killed at the, the uh, Covenant School. And uh, we've prayed already, but we want to continue to pray. And with you guys, you weren't on the show yesterday, didn't have the opportunity to pray. Any, any thoughts, Amy, as you, as you, as you just uh, dwell on this, this situation? Well, it, I, I, it, it's so unbelievably sad and evil and wrong and, uh, I just pray for the families. You know, there was a pastor's daughter who was in that private Christian school. You know, my kids are in a private Christian school. It, it just really hits home to the season that I'm in, to, you know, the life that I live. And I just cannot imagine waking up the next morning with my child not there, not with us. So my heart and prayers are for the families for you know the shooter's family that they're waking up today too heartbroken and i just have to believe today that what jesus came to do guys was to heal the brokenhearted and there's there's no gifts we could give them there's no words we could use to comfort them but we just have to believe that right now the holy spirit is going to go into their homes their life their family at their dinner table in the hard moments and be there to comfort those who are mourning today. You know, I think what we'd like to do is enter into prayer. I'm gonna ask Corey, would you start us off, Corey? And maybe we could all pray today and just let's, let's lift this situation up. God is in the midst of even the most difficult situations. God certainly is not in the, in the evil that happened, but God is in the comfort that can come in this situation. Would you start us off, Corey? Absolutely. Let's pray. Father God, Holy Spirit, we need you more than ever, Father. This nation needs you, God. We need your presence. God, you created us with personality and feelings and emotions and the level of grief and emotion that people are experiencing right now through this loss and this terrible evil is beyond words, God. But you understand how to advocate for us. You understand how to touch us in such a way that gives us peace that surpasses all understanding. So God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just blanket every single family that is grieving, the neighborhood, the community, the extended family, that you would just blanket them with your presence. Let your anointing of love come and let their glory of God begin to just saturate the atmosphere to bring people back to you and bring people closer to revival that this would not be in vain, God, but that you would get the glory, you would get the glory somehow through this situation beyond our understanding that you would be present, a present help in the time of trouble. And we thank you and we bless you and honor you for your presence to help Nashville in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we pray for Nashville. We pray for the families of the victims, the school, their friends. And Father, even 
You know, early this morning, I, I kissed and waved my boys as they as they drove off to their school, and it just, it today, it just really hit home. And Father, I just ask that you comfort the mothers, you comfort the fathers, you comfort the teachers, you comfort the friends. Holy Spirit, we're going to ask that you do what you do best, and you go and you walk alongside them. I thank you that you're our very present help in the time of need. And Father, I just thank you that that Jesus, the reason you came was to heal the brokenhearted. And Father, you bring light and you bring love and you bring your presence. And so Father, we just ask more than ever today that they feel your presence, they feel your healing touch and that God, you do a work um, supernaturally intervene on behalf of this mass school shooting in Jesus name. Lord, we know that you are the one who can bring healing to the worst wounds, Lord. That This is a wounded, uh, mm. the wounded families, the wounded school, the wounded city, Lord. I, I know, Father, that there is a, uh, just a, 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 an incredible hurting there now. So bring your healing, Father. Bring your peace. Glorify your name uh, by just strengthening all those around. We ask it, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So we'll, we will continue to pray as, uh, as, as, as we go through the week. And I and, uh, just would encourage you all to pray as well. Amen. Amen. Our next guest first discovered the Enneagram in 2017 and immediately realized how life-changing it can be. Not long after Elizabeth Bennett decided to become a certified Enneagram coach, Elizabeth joins us now to share how our personalities affect our everyday lives with her new book, Enneagram Life, personal, relational, and biblical insights for all seasons. I love that. Elizabeth, welcome to Hope Today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. First, let's talk about your name, Elizabeth Bennett. That seems to be a pretty famous name. I always um, joke with people that when I met my now husband, um, one of the first things I thought was, if I end up marrying this boy, my name is going to be Elizabeth Bennett. <laughs> and so it was definitely an influence in my first initial crush on my husband, but I definitely love that I get to have that name now. Okay, let's talk about the Enneagram life. Why did you start researching it? What made it attractive to you? Why did you eventually want to become an Enneagram coach with tens of thousands of followers on Instagram listening to your wisdom about the Enneagram life? When did that all begin? Yeah, so I think um, my entire life I've been really interested in personality, whether it be Myers-Briggs, DISC, any, any of those things, I've always been really interested in it. Um, I think just understanding why people are the way they, they are is always something I've been really curious about. And so when I first was introduced to the Enneagram, it came in a very um, pivotal part of my life. We were going through a lot of things, me and my husband, two years into marriage. And it, instead of me f feeling like I was bringing stuff out of my husband, I was able to be, oh, he's reacting to himself and his inner world and how he was made. And it was so illuminating to see how both of us were so different, yet both um, reacting out of hurt and different motivations and all these, and just the way that God made us. Um, and it was so helpful that we ended up teaching our families about the Enneagram. We ended up teaching a lot of our friends about the Enneagram. And we were talking about it so much that we ended up making an Instagram page so that we could kind of share and have community around what we were learning. Um, and then when I became an Enneagram coach, I think I really found a big part of my calling. I love talking to people one-on-one -on -one about their Enneagram type and just seeing those aha moments, see people in utter conf confusion and chaos in their life, all of a sudden have a flashlight put on how God made them and what like their purpose and their meaning might be is just a really, really cool thing. And I don't think I'll ever not do Enneagram coaching. It's so cool. I think uh, the Enneagram is newer probably to most people, but what we do remember is things like birth order, you know, gender roles, culture, the five love languages. How does the Enneagram sort of make all of this make sense? 
Yeah. So um, the Enneagram is based off of motivation. So um, all of us have a pretty distinct motivation we're working out of. Um, and American culture in general is not very good at discerning motivation. We are very behavioral. We love um, introvert, extrovert. We love things that are very external. And so um, when we are looking at things like birth order and love language and all these things, really the question to ask is, what would someone whose motivation is self-worth, how would they interact with being an oldest child? How would that play out? How would that play out with them? having a touch love language. And so uh, when I'm writing this book and I'm asking these people themselves what those things look like for them, um, it's really insightful to see how it all goes back to motivation. Um, my motivation, myself, I'm an Enneagram 4, and my motivation is authenticity. So as um, a middle child, how does authenticity show up? Well, it's me trying to prove that I'm different, me trying to prove that I am my own person within this big family unit. And so a lot of individuality, a lot of um, some rebellious spirit, some, um, you know, grabbing at attention that might not have been there for me shows up in that. How did you break this down into the seasons of life and apply the Enneagram to the different seasons? Because as you mentioned, there's a spring season, a summer season, a fall season, and a winter season. Yeah, so I was really inspired by um, the verse in Ecclesiastes of for everything there is a season, um, a time for joy and a time for mourning and all, all that stuff. I think as you look back on your life, the, you can see such distinct seasons of life that you aren't very aware of when you're in it. Um, and so really what I did was I took all these FAQs, all these frequently asked questions that I get on Instagram and I get in coaching and I'm like, I want to help walk people through these things and how the Enneagram can be very practical in their life. And so, um, using those two inspirations going through spring being your childhood and summer being your adolescence, the shortest, but probably most impactful season, um, fall being your adulthood and then winter being advanced adulthood. Um, just, it all kind of just made sense. And I don't know, I feel like it worked out really beautifully and really poetically in the book. Wow, you've got like three different uh, seasons of life up here on the set right now <laughs> <laughs> to go through. <laughs> but let me, let me ask you, you, you talked about how uh, Enneagram helped you and your husband understand uh, what, uh, what was going on. Tell me a, a story about someone else that has uh, been helped or been uh, touched or something opened up uh, that was freedom for them. Uh, maybe somebody that you've, uh, you've worked with, uh, somebody that's read your book, uh, just a story of someone who's really been helped by this process. Yeah, of course. So one of my coaching clients that was really impactful for me, um, she, at the end of our session said, I have now realized that I spent my entire life thinking I was just really bad at being a different number. Um, so her entire life, she thought that she was supposed to be this achiever type and she was just really bad at being it, you know, and she was really discouraged about how she was made and she really could not name any strengths that she had, um, because she really wanted to be a different person. And so when, um, she realized what she was, she was an Enneagram nine and I'm explaining how, um, sweet and beautiful this type is and how they reflect God individually and how their desire for peace is reflective of God's desire for peace. Um, she just had tears in her eyes of being like, I've never thought there was something that God would call good in how I was made, but there is something that God calls good in how everyone's made. We are a very fractured and imperfect image of that part of God, but we still reflect parts of God and his character all individually and different. And that's why we are a body and we need each other. We need all of these different parts of God's character and God's image. And that could be such an impactful thing when sometimes our negative traits are the loudest to us, but being able to um, hear what God calls good in us is so impactful. And I've seen that with my clients again and again. Wow, you are speaking so deeply and it's just truly resonating. So I took uh, the, the test and I'm also a four. Um, it, it, it was called the, a romantic individualist, right? Which I thought was pretty cool. But what it, what it really focused on was like authenticity as, as you were saying, and I'm the baby in my family. I have an older sister and an older brother. 
And for a, a lot of times throughout my life, I was very emotional. And I oftentimes felt like I needed to fit a mold that was acceptable for my parents. And, and then as I went into ministry, acceptable for ministry. So when I was taking the test, I found that I wasn't trying to answer as honest as possible. Have you ever experienced that <laughs> where people are like, I really don't want to choose these answers because I feel like I'm not allowed to be honest? Have you ever uh, had that experience maybe with yourself or with someone you know? Yeah, um, I feel like in the spring portion of this book, I go over pretty well that especially our parents, they tend to name what they recognize in you. So uh, my both of my parents are not very creative people. Um, and so my creativity was very kind of like brushed off um, as something that wasn't very exciting. And so, but um, my parents did name a lot of my introvertedness, a lot of my um, style and how I liked fashion. And so when I first took the Enneagram test, those are things that I gravitated to as, oh, this is who I am because this is what has been called out in me or what I'm comfortable, you know, claiming as mine. Um, and so, yeah, when a lot of people take the test, either they are going off of things that they have been called in the past or things that they're comfortable with. Whereas I don't think many people, when they go down to take a personality test are, are like willing to do the really, really deep work of actually figuring out what their motivation is. A lot of times it's just a whim or a fun thing. Um, and so, I've seen a lot of people mistype based on the test first. And as they start to research the Enneagram, all of a sudden they'll be looking at a type that makes them feel really gross of like, oh, this is this is not what I would want to be. But I also have a sinking suspicion that this is what I am because this is the one that bothers me the most. And then as people research the Enneagram more, they'll start to kind of get more into an accurate typing. Wow. You know, this really hit home when I started reading about parenting and how a certain number parents and what they want to hear and what they expect and what your parents were. And I mean, I was like, she is getting in all of our business. So I'm going to be <laughs> real transparent and say, you know, I'm an eight. What does that parenting look like? What, what am I going to do to hurt my kids or help my kids? Yeah. So Enneagram eight, I feel like, um, whether they are healthy or unhealthy can look very, very different in how they parent. And obviously all of us, we have some parts of both. None, none of us are completely all a good parent or completely all a bad parent. We have some mixing of both. But the Enneagram 8, really what they want the most, they want their kids to be independent. They want their kids to be protected. Um, and they want their kids to be strong so that they can weather the storm. They can weather whatever's put at them. So that creates a very, um, a very, um, tough and tender parenting style. This very, I want you to be strong. I want you to be independent, but also my strength is for you. Like when I might be tough and I might be a go-getter, but all that strength is for you and not at you. Cause I think sometimes when eights are unhealthy, harshness can come out in their parenting style, but when they are more healthy, uh, their kids know that, that harshness is towards what would hurt them and not towards them, which is a really powerful thing for kids. Wow, well, you just read my mail and I may or may not have been harsh just a few times, but I definitely value independent children. <laughs> it's so funny. Okay, so let's get into like, okay, an eight values. An eight longs to hear, you will not be betrayed. Okay, I'm a pastor. <laughs> You know, with church and staff and people, and I really value not being betrayed. How do I come about that with God's word? What, what scripture, what should I be thinking as I'm processing? I don't like to be betrayed. Yeah, so um, all of these different longings, all of these different words that we want to hear, I think it's so important as parents that we instill in our children that I will never show this to you perfectly. You know, God is the only one who can love you perfectly. And so as an eight, I heard so many eights say, but I have been betrayed. Like I can't absorb that information that I won't be betrayed because I have been betrayed. And so when we are thinking about God though, and we are thinking about how God will not betray you, we are thinking about how God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We're thinking about how God um, called you from the beginning of time. God has always been after your heart and, um, 
good comes to those who will live in his word and live in understanding of the gospel. And so as an Enneagram 8 who is afraid of betrayal in the world, um, it's important to hold on to the fact that God is bigger than the world. God has overcome the world and that God will never betray you. What's a scripture that you would encourage us, you know, before we, you know, finish this conversation about personalities, about how God wired us, how God sees us? Yeah, so I think the verse in Psalms 139.14 about how we are fearfully and wonderfully made is such a beautiful verse. But the verse that you guys are going over today, that verse in Genesis of being made in God's image, um, I think is some one that has been really, really powerful for me and my clients of um, the fact that God, there is part of God that he images through us that the world needs that there are is good in our personality. And as much as we have to work on those hard parts and those bumps, and um, as much as we have to repent and change, there also is good that God has created in us that the world needs um, and that we have that and that God wants us to live and act in that. Beautifully said, Elizabeth. Thank you so much for this book, this time, and these nuggets of wisdom that you've dropped into our life. Uh, bless you so much. All right, we will be right back after this break. When Laura called our 24 seven prayer line, she had so much fear that she didn't want to leave her house. She had lost her husband of 54 years just six months earlier. Laura was flipping through TV stations when she came across Cornerstone Television. She felt compelled to call one of our prayer partners talked, listened, and prayed with her for 45 minutes. At the end, Laura said how much the ministry had helped relieve her fear. Praise God for how he is using CTVN. When you give, you become part of what he's doing. This month, when you give, we'll send wild expectance as our way of saying thank you. This book will inspire you to live your life as God intended. To give and request your copy, visit us online at ctvn.org slash donate or call us at 888-665-4483. Hope happens here. We are back on Hope today. And listen, we just had a phenomenal, phenomenal discussion with Elizabeth Bennett about the, the life of the Enneagram. So today's scripture is actually coming from Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, and it reads, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And as we talk about personality and we talk about being able to live within community with different people, it's not always easy. Even those even in your family, there's a frustration because when you're a four dealing with a five or an eight dealing with a one or your birth order is a certain way or you've been projected on by your parents or your society to be a certain way, there's going to be friction. And I know that one thing that really helps me to be able to work in a a diplomatic way of, of relationship with people is understanding that they are God bearers of, of God. They are image bearers of God. And, and that speaks so vividly that God created them and their uniqueness and we should respect it. Um, Tom, how, how does that speak to you? Well, you know, uh, just think about all the different personalities. God is such a creative God. He's given us these different personalities. Praise God, everybody's not my personality <laughs> or, or just one personality. That, just the way we're able to uh, interact with these different personalities, it shows us the glorious creativity of God. You know, I, I think guys about different churches and how different churches emphasize different things. You know, the, the, the Presbyterians emphasize the sovereignty of God. The, uh, the church I grew up in was a holiness church. They emphasized the holiness of God. Those are okay. Those are good that we get to see these different facets and aspects of God. And we see that in our brothers and sisters when we have the opportunity to interact with them. Amy. Well, think about, you know, like the school shooting, okay? Mm -hmm. And all of the different personalities. I want to go and bring something to that trauma and drama. Tom's probably thinking of a whole other area and viewpoint to, to bring into that. And Corey's probably thinking, oh my gosh, we should do this. And, 
And it's so beautiful that not every person just has it all, but that we're all created and we all represent a different image and heart of God. You know, I, I was thinking just a minute ago that, you know, when my grandma passed away, I remember being in the room when my dad was telling my mom because we had just come in from driving around town or something. And I remember at that young age that I wanted to bring joy and uplift right away. Isn't that interesting? And now I'm thinking about this school th shooting and I'm thinking, how can I go in there and infuse joy and some sort of peace or happiness right now? How can I go in there and lift the room? Yeah. Somebody else might be thinking, how can I go serve them and, and bring them food and, and be a chef and cook yeah. for them? How could I write a song that would bless them? See, God has given us unique personalities to filter life through, to bring his goodness yes. and his glory yes. to earth. Yes, and this is why it's so significant that we take adequate time with God to be able to understand his heart and then also to be able to understand who he made us mm -hmm. because it's always not the easiest thing to understand ourselves and this is what we've been talking about is that time with God helps us to understand who we are because the keys to our character and our personality is locked up in God. Right. So he makes it that we have to go after him and pursue him yeah. to learn who we really are. Yeah. And I think that that is a beautiful thing. So if you learn anything from this, spend time with Jesus, spend time alone with God, talking with him and understanding who you are. You know, it's great. We talk about God changing us. Does he change our personality? Not really, <laughs> not too much. I mean, our personality is pretty set but he changes our character and he changes what's inside of us to bring out the beauty that he's created for us to have. Every flower is different. Every tree is different. Every mountain is different. God hasn't created us to be like anybody else. You can be completely free. Yes, learn from people all around you. Learn from your pastor, learn from your parents, learn from uh, your brothers and sisters in the Lord. Learn from those around you but be who you are, be who God created you to be. When you have that idea in your mind and heart and you follow that, that's freedom for you. Freedom from feeling like you have to be like another person. Boy, I am so glad God has set us free to be who we are. We are individuals and we are those that can serve God with the personality and the, the talents that he's given us. I hope you know the Lord today. He has great and wonderful plans for you. He made you just like you are, but he's changing you into his likeness. Have a great day. On tomorrow's Hope Today, discover the importance and need for sharing the gospel with others. Author Craig Ireland shares how we should go into the world and teach non-believers about God's grace, love, and mercy in order to bring people to Christ. Don't miss tomorrow's Hope Today. Cornerstone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.